This week on the CNET Tech Review, get touchy-feely with the new Nook e-reader, how to make the switch from iPhone to Android, home inventors show off at Maker Faire, and the Droid X2 and Xperia Play leave us wanting more. It's all coming up right now. Hey everyone, welcome to the CNET Tech Review, where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech. And we also offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. I'm Brian Tong, filling in for Molly Wood, who's on a very special assignment this week. But as usual, let's start things off with the good. First up, there were a couple of big announcements in the Windows Phone and e-reader worlds this week. Here's Bonnie Cha and David Carnoy to tell you all about them. Hey everyone, I'm Bonnie Cha, senior editor at CNET.com, and we are here in New York where Microsoft just previewed their new Windows Phone Mango update. There are actually over 500 features coming with the update, but they're concentrating on three key areas, and that's communications, the browser, and apps. Some of the highlights of the update include a group contacts now, and as well as linked inboxes, so you can now link your personal inboxes, which is something we've been looking forward to. With the internet browser, you now get IE9 with support for HTML5. And as for apps, you get third-party multitasking, and they gave a demo here, and it looks pretty easy, so that's a big feature we've been looking for. A couple other highlights include Twitter and LinkedIn integration into your People's Hub, as well as dynamic live tiles for your app, so you can see what's happening right on your start screen. All these features will be coming with the Mango update due out this fall. They're not talking about handsets yet, but we do think we'll hear more about it in late summer or fall, so we'll look forward to some more hardware. and. Mango update. I'm Bonnie Chan. This has been your preview of the Windows Phone Mango wow. update. Hi, I'm David Carnoy, and I'm here with the new Nook. Uh, this is being branded as the simple touch reader. It has a touch screen um, that has Neo Node infrared technology. That's the technology that's in the Sony reader and also the new Kobo Touch Edition. Uh, this device comes with two gigabytes of internal memory as well as an expansion slot, a micro SD expansion slot, so you can add up to 32 gigs on a card, um, and that allows you to store literally thousands of books. Um, the, one of the big deals here is the battery life. Barnes & Noble is saying you can go up to two months on a single charge, uh, and that means that's about twice as long as the, the Kindle right now. As you can see, there are very few buttons on this device. There's one main nook button um, and there is a power button that's really it you navigate everything through the touch screen uh, there's a home screen a shopping um, all the things that you would expect from the old nook but it is on a touch screen device this runs on android 2.1 it weighs 7.5 ounces uh, that's just a shade heavier than the kobo touch edition uh, but this is a very light device barnes and has had sort of uh, this soft touch paint to the back, so it's got a little bit of rubberized feel to it. There's also some buttons on the side of the screen that allow you to do things like go fast forward through a book. In terms of font sizes, you get seven different font sizes, and there are six different styles of fonts. It reads PDF files, but it does not read Word files, and there are no Nook apps available for the device. This is really a strictly an e-reading device. It has a Perl e-ink screen that's readable in direct sunlight. That's the same e-ink screen that's in the Kindle. Um, as well as the new Kobo reader and Sony readers. One of the big issues with e-ink is that you get sort of a ghosting effect, uh, but Barnes & Noble has really uh, taken a lot of care into making sure those flashing um, has been reduced. This is really a pretty quick device. It has a 800 megahertz uh, Texas Instruments OMAP processor in it. This is a Wi-Fi only device. Uh, there is no 3G. Um, it is $139. That's the same price as the Kindle Wi-Fi. However, it is $25 more than the Kindle with special offers. Barnes & Noble is making a big deal about the social networking features in this device. There's something called Nook Friends uh, that allows you to share what you're reading, what's in your library with friends. One of the nice things about uh, having the touchscreen is you can do the dictionary lookup. Uh, you can actually tap and hold on a word, and that word will come up, and it will automatically look up the word. So there you have it, the new Nook, the simple touch reader. We'll soon find out whether it is a Kindle killer. 
Um, it is a smaller device than the Kindle, um, and the touchscreen certainly adds um, a navigational element that the Kindle does not have right now. Uh, it will be interesting to see what Amazon's response to it is. I'm David Carnoy, and that's the new Nook, the simple touch reader. Thanks for watching. That new touchscreen is pretty nice, but the Nook isn't the only e-reader that has one. As David mentioned, he also got a look at the new Kobo Touch, and you can see more of it over at CNETTV.com. Now, turning from touchscreens to touch pads, next up, Scott Stein brings us a look at the latest in the ThinkPad Edge series from Lenovo. Though not as slim or as light as some of its competitors, this new Edge does feature a new touchpad design, plus many other features ThinkPad fans have come to expect from a business laptop. Hey, I'm Scott Stein, Senior Editor at CNET.com, and this is the Lenovo ThinkPad Edge E220S. Now, what good is a laptop if it's not portable? And sometimes it's nicer for a laptop to be even more portable. Now, this ThinkPad Edge 220S kind of falls into that ultra-portable category. What does that mean? Well, it's a little bigger than a netbook. It's a little smaller than a full-size laptop. It's kind of that strange middle ground. But with a 12.5-inch screen and these dimensions, it means that it's going to feel more compact in your bag, and it's not going to feel quite as heavy. It's about 3.2 pounds, um, which is a nice weight to carry around. And it's under an inch thick. And uh, really what the 12.5-inch screen amounts to is it kind of compresses the edges here, making for that smaller size and, and allowing the keyboard to fill the space. And it is a full-size keyboard, which is nice. Going into that, why do you get a ThinkPad? Well, you get it for its business features and its business software, but also a lot of people like its ergonomics. The ThinkPad Edge keyboard is a new raised keyboard. We saw this on the ThinkPad Edge design last year. It's also on the ThinkPad X1 that we just reviewed. It's great. It's a really nice raised keyboard. It's got concave keys. We won't go too much more into it, but if you're a keyboard nut, you're going to like it. Also, there's a trackpad on here that's a click pad. There are no more buttons on the bottom here. This is a dual click zone area. There are buttons up here, but what those are for is for this red nubbin that is known as the track point. This is on most ThinkPads, and it's, uh, some people like it because on a plane, they won't have to move their finger around as much. Anyway, there's not as much cramping here because those buttons have been removed, so there's more finger space. There are a couple of upscale features on this Edge 220S2 that put it a little bit above the standard ThinkPad line. Infinity glass, glossy display, Dolby sound in its speakers. And there's also a neat little light that comes up that lights up your keyboard. We've seen that on other ThinkPads before, but it's a nice feature to have. And it comes complete with your basic ports, three USB 2.0, it's got HDMI. It also has full laptop specs inside. You're talking about four gigs of RAM in this one, a 320 gigabyte hard drive. It's got a Core i5 processor, that's second gen Intel Core i5, although it is low voltage, which means it runs at a slower speed. It's actually the same processor that we saw in the Samsung Series 9, really thin laptop that we reviewed earlier this year. The starting price on the Edge 220S is 749 That's a lot cheaper than the $1,600 of the Samsung Series 9. Now, this is not as thin a laptop, and the battery life is not as good, but when you can get a laptop like this at that price, that's really nice, and it's a lot more affordable than the ThinkPad X1, the super high-end 13-inch laptop that we reviewed recently that's about as thin. In a nutshell, this is a ThinkPad we'd carry around with us. I really love the IdeaPad U260, which came out earlier in the year. Almost the same design, but was on the IdeaPad side of things. Had a really nice, slick look, but had last year's Core i5 processor and worse battery life. The battery life improvements on this are nice, gets it over four hours, plus it's got a faster processor. You probably like that total package. And at under $800 for two gigs of RAM in that configuration, it's hard to complain. I'm Scott Stein, and this is a look at the Lenovo ThinkPad Edge E220S. So it looks like Lenovo has redeemed itself after that nasty beating the ThinkPad X1 suffered in last week's tech review. Now, I'm just glad Molly was the one who said it, and not me. Now, you might know I host a show called The Apple Bite, and we're not going to make this an Apple versus Android battle, but there are plenty of reasons why you might want to switch from Apple to Android. <laughs> Drop calls. Yeah, so here's Sharon Wagner with some of the tips to make the process less painful. Hey, current iPhone users, I'm Sharon Vaknin. Since you've probably already decided to switch to Android, I'm not going to tell you all of the benefits of doing it. 
You already know that you're getting a highly customizable interface and that you can choose from a huge selection of phones. I also don't need to tell you that you're probably getting a faster processor and a better camera along with free turn-by-turn -turn navigation. You know these things and more, so now it's time to figure out how to get all your iPhone data to your shiny new Android phone. All right, get your iPhone, Android, and computer out in front of you. The least you need to do before following these steps is add your Google account to your new phone by going to Menu, Settings, Account and Sync, Add Account, Google, and then following the steps on the screen. If you don't have a Google account, there's also an option to create one. Let's start by transferring your contacts. Connect your iPhone to your computer and launch iTunes. Click on your phone's name, then go to the Info tab. Check Sync Contacts with Google Contacts. And now enter the same Gmail account associated with your phone. Then apply the changes. Your contacts are now being transferred from your iPhone to Gmail and from Gmail to your Android. Calendars and notes are also easy to transfer. On your iPhone, go to Settings and then Mail, Contacts, and Calendars. If the Gmail account you're using with your Android isn't here, add it. Then go back to Mail Settings, tap the account, and turn Syncing on for Calendars and Notes. Now your calendar will transfer to your new phone and your notes will be filed under a label in Gmail called Notes. You can't sync notes back to your Android, but they're safe in Gmail and searchable if you ever need to find them. Now it's time for some bad news. There's really no easy syncing for Android like there was for your iPhone through iTunes. Everything is done with manual dragging and dropping, mostly for photos, videos, and music. Let's start with photos and videos. We first need to get them off your iPhone and onto your computer. Mac users, just connect your iPhone to your computer and launch Image Capture. Put the photos in a new folder on your desktop and hit Download All. If you're on Windows, plug in your phone and open My Computer. You'll see the phone show up as an imaging device. Right-click it and hit Explore. Then drag and drop all the photos and videos into a new folder on your desktop. Now, connect your Android phone to your Windows or Mac computer. Mount the phone and you'll see it show up on your desktop. Open it and find the pictures folder. Sometimes it's called DCIM, but if you don't see one, just create it. You can name it Photos. Then just drag and drop the files from your hard drive onto the Android Pictures folder and let it transfer. Once it's done, the photos will show up in the Gallery app on your phone. And of course, you can also add other photos and videos from your hard drive using the same drag and drop method. The same method applies to putting music on your Android. You might be thinking about your text messages and voicemail. Right now, there's no simple way to export these items from your iPhone. It's possible, but the process itself really deserves its own how-to. If there are specific text messages you want to keep, you can forward them to your email account by going to Messages, opening the conversation, hit Edit, and then tap the messages you want to forward. Hit Forward and send it to your email address. That's really the only easy option. With your contacts, calendars, photos, music, and videos on your new Android, what are you going to do with your old iPhone? Well, you can keep it and basically use it as an iPod, or you can sell it somewhere online like Gazelle, or you can make mom happy and give her a nice gift. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. See guys, that's just too complicated. You'll be much happier if you just stay with your iPhone. Trust me, I promise, and thank you. Seriously though, if you do decide to make the switch and you've transferred all your music to your new phone or to the cloud, you'll probably find the standard Android music app a little bit lacking. Luckily, we've compiled the top five Android music player apps that you can use instead. If you recently bought an Android phone, and about half of all smartphone buyers lately did exactly that, you know it's a Swiss Army knife of a thing. But how are you with the music player that comes with it? Yeah, right? I'm Brian Cooley with the top five Android music players that'll make you forget how to even spell iPod, courtesy of a list done by CNET's Josh Goldman. Number five is the Amazon Cloud Player. This freebie is hot new stuff. Buy, store, and play the music from the cloud. That's the internet. 
or you can download the files if you like. So quaint. Five gigabytes of space is provided to you for free from Amazon. 20 gig if you buy just one MP3 album from them. Now it's not that well developed as a player in terms of managing your music just yet, but it's a healthy taste of where things are going. Number four is called Mixing. This guy has something akin to the genius technology you find in iTunes, so it's kind of spooky how it can suggest music based on just a song or two you feed it. It'll make and tune playlists that keep getting more and more like you the more you use it. It also has built-in artist information, uh, direct links out to YouTube videos of their music videos, and also a graphic EQ. And it's free, but if you pay $5, the ads go away. Number three is TuneWiki. Now, in my view, people are either music people or they're lyric people. And this app is for the latter. It'll show you timed, paced lyric subtitles while the music's playing, while also getting the album art up there, along with player controls. You can drive it by voice as well through the Android voice layer. And you can use it to map the locations of other TuneWiki users nearby. So that whole spooky obsession with lyrics thing that you've got going on, can wig out someone other than just your former friends. Oh, and it's free. Number two is called Power Amp. Now, in spite of the title, it doesn't just play death metal. It's totally about quality sound with a 10-band EQ that sweetens just about every audio format, and it plays just about all of them. You can even set EQ per song, which, given the variable quality of most of our MP3s, is a welcome feature. Bottom line, Power Amp just sounds great. It's five bucks, but there is a free 15-day trial. Before I get you to number one, don't think there are just five great audio players for Android. Check out Josh Goldman's full 10-app slideshow on CNET.com. Oh, and by the way, if you have questions about using your Android phone as your in-car audio player, check out the Android Atlas podcast. That's at 2 o'clock on Thursdays. That's 2 o'clock Pacific at CNET.com slash live. There you'll find my car tech colleague, Antoine Goodwin, and he knows how to connect all the dots between cars and Android. Okay, the number one music player we love for Android is called Player Pro. The features? What doesn't it have? Search, download, and save lyrics. Great tag editing. 10-band EQ, social network integration, oh, and I love this, lots of really usable home screen widgets and different lock screen widgets with customizable control options so your phone really works and feels like a true iPod. This is the do-all player for Android. It costs an odd $4.51, hmm, but there is a free five-day trial. You're going to love it and want to pay for it. Great music players for Android. Just one more reason the smartphone will eventually eat the entire tech industry. For more videos like this, go to top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. Wow, those are some pretty good apps. You know, I wish iTunes did all of that. Fine. Well, guys, it looks like it's time to take a break. We'll be right back for more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Now we've already seen some of the good stuff, so you know what? It must be time for the bad. This week we've got a couple more Android phones for your consideration. Now our editors had high hopes for these handsets when they were announced, but it turns out they really couldn't live up to the hype. The Motorola Droid X was one of Verizon's most popular phones last year, but the tech world moves fast and it's time for a new model to step in. Hey everyone, I'm Bonnie Cha, Senior Editor at CNET.com, and I'm here with your first look at the Motorola Droid X2, the successor to the Droid X, though you really wouldn't know it just by looking at it. The two phones pretty much have identical designs. The X2 is the same size and weight as the original model, so you're looking at a big chunk of hardware here but I wouldn't say it's any worse than the other 4.3 inch touchscreen models out there. If anything, the bump on the back adds just a little extra bulk. While the phone looks the same, Motorola did upgrade the display on the X2 from a WVGA screen to a higher resolution QHD display. It's a very good looking screen, but not quite as sharp or smooth as the iPhone's Retina display or Samsung Super AMOLED Plus screens. Still, you're not going to have any problems reading what's on screen, and the extra space makes it great for viewing websites and videos. 
One other quick difference about the X2's design is that Motorola removed the dedicated camera button on the right side, so now you have to use the touch screen, which I'm not too happy about. Aside from the display, the biggest improvement that the X2 offers is the addition of a dual core processor. The benefit of this is that the smartphone offers snappier performance, particularly when it comes to browsing and gaming. I was able to play 3D games with no problem and it handled most websites with no problem. The unfortunate thing is that the Droid X2 isn't 4G capable, so you'll have to browse on 3G speeds, which isn't horrible, but it would have been a nice addition for this upgraded phone. Because of the lack of 4G, obviously the Droid X2 is going to turn some people off, and to be honest, I was disappointed too. And if you fall into that camp, I'd say take a look at the HTC Thunderbolt or Samsung Droid Charge. Maybe wait for the Droid Bionic. But if you're okay with just 3G, I think there's a lot to like about the X2. It's got fast performance, good call quality, and battery life, so you're getting a very solid performer here. The Motorola Droid X2 is available now for $199.99 with a two-year contract. I'm Bonnie Chan. This has been your first look at the Motorola Droid X2. I'm Nicole Lee, Senior Associate Editor for CNET.com, and this is a first look at the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play. This is essentially Sony's answer to the much-touted and much-hyped PlayStation phone. This phone does indeed have a slide-out gaming pad. As you can see here, the gamepad looks very similar to Sony's PlayStation DualShock controller. You get the D-pad on the one side here and the usual PlayStation face buttons on the other side. You also get the same select and start buttons on the bottom right here. In the middle, instead of two analog joysticks, you get two touch-sensitive circles. These circles essentially act as the analog controls. You would use these analog controls to control things like movement and camera viewing angles. As you might expect, the Xperia Play comes with a few games with it. It comes with Bruce Lee, Dragon Warrior, Asphalt 6, a racing game, as well as an old PlayStation classic, Crash Bandicoot. If you wish to get more games for the Xperia Play, you can select the little button down here and that will lead you to a featured list of Xperia Play games on the Vcast App Store. As far as the gameplay experience goes, we do think these physical controls offer a richer gameplay experience over the usual touchscreen controls of most phones. However, we thought the analog joystick controls just were not as responsive as we would like. We ended up just using these physical controls for the most part. However, not all games are configured to use these gameplay controls, so make sure you find the games that are meant for the Xperia Play. On the whole, we found the gameplay experience very immersive using these physical controls. It's definitely much more of a richer gameplay experience than just using the touchscreen controls. Also on the side of the phone here are the left and right shoulder buttons. The Xperia Play ships with the latest version of Android, Gingerbread 2.3. They did not clutter up the phone with any fancy interface. On the front of the Xperia Play is a very bright and colorful 4-inch capacitive touch display. You get up to five customizable home screens. You also get all the usual gingerbread features. Above the display is a front-facing VGA camera. And on the back is a 5-megapixel camera lens and LED flash. So is the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play for you? If you're a serious mobile gamer that wants to take your gaming to the next level, then this does offer a richer gameplay experience. But there are a few faults. The phone doesn't have 4G LTE, and the analog joysticks are wanting. We do think it's a better gameplay experience than most other touchscreen smartphones, but we don't think it's enough for you to give up your PSP or Nintendo DS just yet. The Sony Ericsson Xperia Play is available for around $200 with a two-year service agreement with Verizon Wireless. I'm Nicole Lee, this has been a first look at the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play. Alright, so those phones aren't total failures, but come on Motorola, no 4G? Seriously. And like Nicole said, I'll pass on the Xperia Play and stick with my PSP. Now let's wrap things up with this week's bottom line. Each year, Maker Faire events across the country give home inventors and artists the opportunity to show off their creations to the public. Now, last weekend, the crew from the Crave Podcast took a tour of the Bay Area edition of Maker Faire, and here's what they found.
Hey, I'm Donald Bell. And I'm Eric Franklin, and we're at the 2011 Maker Fair in San Mateo, California. This is a celebration of inventors and their inventions, craftiness, all kinds of cool stuff. And there's always some cool tech to see, so let's go inside and check it out. This was originally started as kind of a goofy Halloween costume project. It's a shareware program, um, and the models are available from Google SketchUp. Uh, there's a Halo costuming wiki. What is this exactly? Uh, well, this is a kinetic sculpture. Kinetic artists do a different, uh, sort of a wide range of kinetic work. Oh, there's a button here that you can push right. and hold, and when you do that, the ah, eyes will bobble up and down. Beautiful, as they should be. You're here to show off awesome robot sculpture. The umbrella term we use is kinetic sculpture. My particular approach is to use only things that I can find. Keyhole covers, ukulele knobs. The whole head is a voltage meter that's been flipped upside down and gutted out. This one's name is Doubtful because that's the center line reading on this gauge here. I know there's a story behind how you've actually come to create this. I disassemble typewriters exclusively and I reassemble them into human figures and animals. I don't solder, I don't glue, I don't weld, I don't wire things together. I just use the existing parts from typewriters and reassemble everything. This is the plasma drive of the Raygun Gothic rocket ship, ah. which is a 40-foot tall retro-styled rocket yeah, ship, right? which is currently installed on the pier of San Francisco. The science fact is this is a platform for studying a high voltage phenomena called a dielectric barrier discharge. As it turns, this crackles with, with high voltage electricity. And, and you're gonna do that for us right now? No, oh. unfortunately we can't turn on the high voltage here. No, I think that's probably, um, it's probably the right, right way, to, way to go. It's, it requires darkness and it's something of an intimate <laughs> affair, but there's some great pic uh, videos of it on my webpage, almostscientific.com. Cool. It's kind of fun. I've never done anything vaguely artistic in my life. Well, this is a send-up of the typical tracked home of an irritant sprawl. The chassis is a two-inch water pipe. It runs at about um, a good jogging speed. Well, something, That's right? Something. You don't want the flamingos to blow off. So this is the boxing. All the different routines are stored in the Android phone, is that, or, and that's sending that information out to another microcontroller? Inside the some motor is the uh, sensors and the controller to the motors. All right, come on, give me the hug. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> What are you showing here at Maker Faire today? So we're showing Fire Jam, which is a rock experience using Rock Band, which is a video game. Basically, the way it works is we have, we have my friend John over here playing the guitar. We took that guitar, you plug it in the computer, it sends data to the Arduino, which is a little microcontroller that uh, basically controls anything you want to. It's completely open source, you can program anything on. It takes that five volts that you got from the Arduino uh -huh. and puts it on and sends it to the relay, which gets which makes about five volts 120. Right. So that 120 volts goes into one of these solenoids, uh -huh. and the solenoids make it uh, open up when they, get the, when they get electricity, and then the propane flows right through and out the top. The bottom line this week, I want a robot hug. But that's it though, you know guys, I won't let this thing get past first base. That would be just weird or not. Okay folks, that's gonna be our show, but we'll be back next week with a brand new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thanks for watching.